All right, so we heard a lot last week on this show about the interesting projects that Google has its hands in. One of those, I will admit, seemed so pie in the sky when I heard about it a year ago that I was taken by surprise when Google announced the next stage of Project Abacus last Friday. Joining us to talk all about Project Abacus is Sean Hollister from CNET. How's it going, Sean? Hey there. Doing pretty well yourself. Excellent. Even better now that we have you on the line to talk a little bit about passwords Google says that 70% of users forget their passwords once a month, which I know is true for myself. Uh, what is it about passwords that, I don't know, that makes them suck so badly? I think I think I forget my password a lot more often than that. <laughs> uh, the problem for me personally is I use passwords that are a little bit similar to each other, and I can't remember the slight differences I make each time. Other times I go for really complex passwords, and then I completely forget what the heck they are. So instead of that, Project Abacus wants to analyze how you use your computer and take that to mean that it's actually you. So instead of saying, hey, I'm going to type my password into this form, it'll say, well, how are you using your keyboard? When your fingers bounce off of the touch screen, if we analyze that data, if we combine that with what you look like, how your fingers bounce, um, little emails, you get all kinds of little signals it can have about you. It can say, this is actually you. It can get some kind of percentage score to make it feel like maybe it knows that this is you. And from there, if the, uh, if the organization using this score trusts that it is indeed you, it can say, yeah, well, that's probably him. You probably let him or her into that application. Yeah, what's crazy, we're actually looking at um, a B-roll from last year's I.O., not this year's. They went into a lot more detail on it um, at last year's I.O., where basically what you're seeing now is a person who they trust, I guess what is now referred to as the trust um, the trust API that's that's operating this behind the scenes, um, is using it. He's typing, you know, the, the phone can see his camera, see him on the camera. It uses all of these different data points to give a high trust score. And then somebody else comes on and their typing's different. They look different. You know, they've got different, maybe they bounce the phone in a different sort of way uh, when they're typing. And all these things are tells um, to allow it to make make these indications. Tells um, are really the right word. It's just yeah. these little subtle signals that it gets based on the sensors in the phone. You might, you, you might not know that when you tap on the keys of your phone in a certain way, it's not just the order that you press them in, it's the way your phone moves. Maybe you shake it a little bit a certain way that other people don't. So they get a better idea of whether it's you or not. So in your uh, CNET article, Sean, you called it creepy. Um, I've been, <laughs> I've been uh, criticized for using the word creepy. I mean, is it is it like weird? I, it's weird when you think about it, like, oh, they know the way I walk, they know where I am, and they're using that. But is it really a violation? I mean, do you see it as a violation of privacy, all these trust scores? It, it really depends on what your definition of privacy is and whether you care about privacy in the traditional sense. I personally don't. I'm of a generation where I um, believe it has something to do with the generation. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm just a person who doesn't care whether my privacy is invaded. Maybe I'll say it. But the idea for me is all of this information about me, most of the information that anyone would want to know about me is out there anyhow. I don't see myself finding a good way to protect against it, and I do have tangible benefits from the services that these companies provide for me. I'm willing to let Google know all these little things about me behind the scenes as long as I don't have to worry about typing a password in again, as long as I don't have to worry about getting home uh, using driving directions. If it knows, hey, I'm on my way home, and it's going to recommend you know, a gas station for me or something when I need that because it senses that my car needs gas, I'm okay if Google knows those kinds of things in order to help me out. So um, when so Google basically what they announced essentially, and they spent very little time on it at, during the um, the ATAP session on Friday, but they basically said that they're going to have a partner or uh, partner banks that are testing this. Do we have any further information on that? No, no. I reached out to Google today, but they didn't tell me which banks they're working with. They didn't say when exactly uh, this is going to roll out and if it'll be a trial with actual users. But what we do know is there are several financial institutions that are going to be trialing this technology next month in June. And then if everything goes well, they say, they hope to roll it out to developers by the end of the year. Now, that's not us. That is developers who want to work on this technology, including banks. If the bank says, hey, I'm going to let somebody log into their account, see what their balance is, you know, take a withdrawal out, 
without typing in a password, that's going to be on the banks and the bank's software developers to decide that they trust this enough to use it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Becky, how do you feel? Uh, how do you feel about handing over kind of <laughs> your your usage fingerprint, as it were, um, of how you use your device? I mean, it's it's taking all of these factors in, so it's kind of hard to even like understand like what kind of information you're giving them in a shake when you're using your phone. But how, how does it strike you? I know that we need to have the, the the contrasting voice for this is a violation of privacy <laughs> and they don't need to have this information to be able to read if those are my eyebrows or my friend's eyebrows or if normally the the plot the place I'm in, you know, they have the right heuristics for making these decisions. Sadly, I cannot represent that point of view. <laughs> anyone who can crack the password yeah. conundrum is a genius and will be a gazillionaire. So you can understand why there's a huge business model here for Google. And I was just, as I was listening to Sean, I was thinking about the uh, enterprise applications for something like this, because, you know, um, when I, my password for ABC, it changes all the time. And then, you know, you're trying to you make a memorable password, you try and remember it, and then you have to remake it six weeks, eight weeks, whatever, three months later, then you have to remember that one. And then you think of how much time corporate IT departments spend managing password, you know, the evaporation. Uh, I could see this as being so much bigger even than just what we're doing um, with our financial services apps and anything that mandates that level of privacy. Um, you know, you also think about it when we're seeing a lot of these big hacks, it's people using social engineering saying that they've forgotten their password. So if we can get rid of some of that social engineering aspects and give more um, aspects of protecting passwords and, and helping that whole system to just work better, I think it's really going to have a net effect of increasing privacy, not decreasing it. And Google suggested that this may not just be for your core password, the password that you enter in to log into a service, this might replace your two-factor authentication. This might be the backup scheme that they use in addition to a password so that instead of right now I have to enter in a password and maybe I also have to log into a certain application on my phone to figure out what my timed code is that syncs with servers and all kinds of crazy server gibberish there. Instead of that, it might be something where you have to have your main, remember your main password, your main PIN, or something like that. And then this is the more secure way of doing that second step to make sure that it actually is you. Google has rolled out some interesting security measures in past. Uh, one of those was Face Unlock, which <laughs> was did not last very long. They actually brought it back in a different sense, and it's it's currently in Android devices, but. You know that was touted as an you know as a new uh, interesting un un you know untried by others way of unlocking your device. How do you feel about about what you're seeing with Project Abacus versus something you know that that didn't succeed uh, with Face Unlock? Well, Face Lock really didn't succeed because it was a two dimensional image. You could just take a picture of somebody yeah. and stick it up to your screen. If there was a picture of my face, you know, on a piece of paper, that could fool the system. But now we have depth cameras. We have cameras that can see in three dimensions. And that's something that we can actually use with Windows 10 now. Google isn't the only one working on this, let's get rid of the whole password thing. Microsoft has something called Windows Hello, where if you've got a depth sensing camera built into your laptop, and there are a couple of those on the market now, if you've got a fingerprint reader or something like that, it can very, very quickly log you into Windows 10 without having a password. Microsoft is using this as part of something called the FIDO Alliance. They're a group of technology companies that want to take this very simple, you know, face login, fingerprint login, very, very easy login, and they want to translate that to the web as well. They want to say, you've logged into your operating system with this, and now that I know it's you, let's let you automatically log into websites with this kind of thing too. And that's a standard that's currently in development. Right. 